Leadership is the challenge to be something more than mediocre. The challenge to be something more than mediocre. It was said of Abraham Lincoln, when his mother died, she, he was at her bedside when she died. And her last words to him were, be somebody, Abe. And if that story is true, you must have taken it to heart. Be somebody. That's a good challenge. Be somebody. Be somebody wise. Be somebody strong. Strength is attractive. Be somebody kind. All of the attributes of leadership are a unique challenge. Now here's the real key. Learn to be strong, but not rude. There's always the thin line that you have to wa watch and make sure you don't cross. Learn to be strong, but not rude. The challenge is to be kind, but not weak. Learn to be bold, but not a bully. The challenge is to be humble, but not timid. Be thoughtful, but not lazy. Learn to be proud, but not arrogant. That's a challenge. Learn to have humor without folly. It's okay to uh, you know, tell funny stories, but the key in leadership is don't be silly. Right? There's a difference between being silly and, and having humor. Okay, that's the challenge of leadership. Now, leadership should understand the 20%, 80% rule. And the 20%, 80% rule, I don't know exactly where it came from, but if you're going to be involved with people any amount of time or any number of people from whatever walks of life, you've got to understand what we call the 20%, 80% rule. And if you haven't heard it before, let me give it to you. The 20%, 80% rule says, it seems like 20% of the people do 80% of the business and 80% of the people do 20%. It's just one of those strange things about life. And we can ask why's all day long. A lot of things you don't ask why. Let the obvious be your best teacher. Almost any, per, any per enterprise, right? Whether it's a business or a club or whatever. Sure enough, 20% of the people do 80%, 80% do 20%. Ask the minister of the church, right? Who picks up the tab here? I'll bet you he will say, well, let's see, about 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab. And 80% pick up 20%. It's just one of those interesting statistics about life, okay? Now, once you understand the 20%, 80% rule, here's what you must learn to do as a leader. Don't try to change it. This is not something you change. This is something you work with. See, there's a lot of things in life you don't change. You don't say, I think I'll take fall and put it after uh, winter. You say, no, no, no. See, that's too difficult. You don't change fall around and put it after winter. You leave it where it is. But you learn to work with it like it is, okay? The best beginning for any successful venture is reality. Let's figure out how it really is and not kid ourselves and not wish it was different. Okay, so we take the 20%, 80% rule like it is and we learn to work with it. Now here are some of the key points in understanding the 20%, 80% rule. If you wish to affect your business 80%, you must work with the 20%. It's just one of those things you just learn to work with. To affect your business 80%, you work with the 20% that are creating 80% of the business. Now, let me give you a unique part of life. The pull is in the opposite direction, and it always is. Here's what success is. Success is learning to move in the opposite direction of the normal negative pull. Success is just overcoming the normal negative downward trend. Because I guess that's what life was meant to be. Overcoming the normal negative downward pull. Success is moving in the opposite direction. Life that springs from the seed really is moving in the opposite direction. Gravity wants to pull the seed down, but sure enough, the seed being pulled down by the soil takes root, comes to life, Right, comes to life, takes root, starts to grow, and which way does it grow? 
up, right? It gets the roots and the nourishment, but it grows up. It pushes its way against gravity, right? It moves up, and that's what success is. That's what life is, of movement in the opposite direction. So, guess who wants 80% of your attention? The wrong percentage. The 80% of whatever enterprise you're working with, you got a group of people going, 80% of them want 80% of your time. They say, well, we're the 80%. But see, you've got to learn to resist that. Now you do it diplomatically. You do it with intelligence. But if you want to be successful, you got to do it. Okay? You've got to give 80% of your time to the 20% and 20% of your time to the 80%. Somebody says, well, now, how do you do that? Well, now, here's where you got to get smart. Here's what I learned to do with the 20%, 80% rule. I learned to give the 20% individual time and the 80% group time. I just figured that out. Right. I say, well, these 80% are only producing 20% of the business. So I've got to figure out a way to talk to them by groups. Now I can talk to an individual that's doing the high production, but I can only talk to the groups in these collection of people that are doing the small production. Okay? Now guess who wants your individual time? The wrong percentage. What you got to do is just diplomatically move in the opposite direction. You just diplomatically learn how to just give the group time to the 80% individual time to the 20%. Now this is not something you fight, it's something you work with. Guy says, oh, I got it made, here's what I will do. I'll just eliminate the 80%. Right, they're only getting 20% of the business anyway, I'll just get rid of them. And I'll just keep the 20%. Well, you can do that, but here's what'll happen pretty soon. The people that you've got left after you have fired the 80%, sure enough, 20% of them will be doing 80% of the business and 80% will be doing 20%. This is like the seasons. This is not something you try to rearrange. This is something you get smart enough to work with. Now, every leader must have some listening time to what's going on in the field, what's happening with the people. Here's what you must do with your listening time. You must give 80% of your listening time to the 20% and 20% of your listening time to the 80%. Now, guess who wants 80% of your listening time? The wrong percentage. So you just have to learn to be diplomatic. Okay? It's incredible. This is something you learn to work with and not against. Now, what you do is just learn to capitalize on the way things are. To create the market, most people buy when it's high and sell when it's low, right? That's normal. That's the normal scare. That's the normal being uneasy. Buy when it's high, sell when it's low. Guess who becomes wealthy? The people who move in the opposite direction. Now that takes tremendous strength of will capacity and knowledge and it doesn't mean you hit it every time but it does mean your chances are much better to buy when it's low and sell when it's high right? that's what success is success is moving in the opposite of the normal negative downward pull but what's unique about human enterprise is unique things can be accomplished by understanding the world set up, understanding how people are, and learning how to work with it and not against it. Here's the next one, decision. And decision making is powerful, and it's emotional. That's those knots in the pit of your stomach, right? Waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, trying to decide. We sometimes call it inner civil war. What shall I do? Well, for progress, you must decide. The best advice I can give you came from a wealthy friend of mine who said, if it's easy, do it easy. If it's hard, do it hard. Just get it done. If you went home tonight 
and in the next few days, cleaned up a whole list of decisions that might furnish enough inspiration for the next 10 years. I found this out many times after you've decided getting on with it is easier than deciding. Sometimes decision is the toughest part. Here's the next emotion, desire, wanting to bad enough. And I don't know how to tell you to want to, that's something you've got to come up with. There's two things I know about desire. Number one, it comes from inside, not outside. You don't send off for it. Number two, I know desire can be triggered by something. Who knows what it might be? Sometimes desire waits and sleeps for something to happen. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a song, maybe it's a sermon, maybe it's a lecture, a seminar, maybe it's the conversation of a friend, a happening, an event. Who knows? The best I can, advice I can give you is what I give my staff. It goes like this, welcome every human experience. You never know which one is going to turn it all on. Even the bad experience. Sometimes from the bitterest experience comes the greatest awakening. So let down the barriers, take down the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Let life touch you. Don't let it kill you, but let it touch you. Here's the last one. This one's powerful. Resolve. Resolve says I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. Benjamin Disraeli once said, nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on the extent of its purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. See, that's powerful. That could be the day that turns your life around. The world has a strange way of stepping aside when somebody says, I'll do it or die. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They've told me it's too high, it's too far, it's too rocky, it's too difficult. It's never been done before, but it's my mountain, I will climb it. Pretty soon you'll see me waving from the top. Or dead on the side, because I ain't coming back. The best definition I ever got from the word resolve came from a little junior high girl in Foster City, California, up north. I'm talking to the junior high kids one day. I love to ask kids definitions. They come up with beauties. I got to the word resolve and I asked, who can tell me what resolve means? And I got several hands and they were all pretty good, but the last one was the best. Little girl, about three rows back, held up her hand. She said, Mr. Rowan, Mr. Rowan, I think I know what resolve means. I said, darling, what do you think it means? She said, I think it means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's it. Webster, stand aside. That is the definition. Promise yourself you will never give up. I asked the kids, how long should the, a baby try to learn how to walk? How long? How long would you give your average baby before you shut him off? How long? <laughs> See, any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby's going to keep trying until it learns how to walk. What a magic form. Now let me show you what triggers all emotions into activity that brings results. And results is the name of the game. Here it is. Action. Finally, you must do something about how you feel. Jesus the master teacher said, don't just be listeners, be doers. The world admires the doers. Another Bible phrase says, faith without action is useless. Some people these days are big on affirmations. You've got to be very careful of affirmations. There's a thin line between faith and folly. The best clue I can give you on affirmations is this. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. And there's nothing worse than delusion. The guy keeps walking west looking for the sunrise. I mean, delusion is bad. However, Affirmation with discipline can bring the most spectacular results. Make sure 
You always have a game plan to match your wishes. Otherwise, they will always be wishes. The day that turns your life around. Let me give you four questions to take home when we're finished. These are called questions to ponder. And this wraps it up. Okay, here's the questions I want you to take home in closing. First question is one of the major questions of the world. Why? Why should you try? Why read that many books? Why go that far? Why earn that much? Why share that much? Why learn all that? Why get up that early? Why put yourself through that much? Why try for all that? Good question. Why? One of the best answers to why is the second question. Why not? What else are you going to do with your life? Why not see how many books you can read, how far you can go, how much you can earn, how many friends you can make, how much personality you can develop, influence you can have, how many things you can accomplish, how far you can go and what you can see. Why not? You got to stay here till you go. Why not? The third question is, why not you? Why not you? Some people have done the most incredible things with limited start. Why not you? Some people have done so well, they get to go, they get to see it all, they get to do it. They get to be there. They get to have it, they get to enjoy it. Why not you? Why not you watching the morning mist rise over the mountains of Scotland? Someday you got to gaze directly at the Mona Lisa. I can show you where to find the most exquisite seashells in Miami and the Bahamas. I know where they are. Why not you? You got to shop on Fifth Avenue in New York. You got to stay at the Waldorf Astoria. Why not you? You got to drink in an Arizona sunset. You got to see the world. You got to read the books. You've got to do the enterprises. You've got to be involved in commerce and love and travel and experiences. You got to do it all. Why not you? You've got to know the results that come from splendid discipline. There's nothing like a view from the top. And the last question is, why not now? Don't postpone your better future any longer. Get at it tomorrow with new vigor. Get you some new books. Ask some new questions, set some new goals, get you a new journal, start your projects book, get a game plan going, do some more reading, start to make changes, have conversations, make contact, and do it now. And if you will, I have a feeling one of these days we'll be hearing your story. You'll make us a phone call, write us a letter, get in touch with us and let us know what's happening to you. I want to thank you for being here. My final comment would be ask for God's help, which may sound a little strange coming from a strictly commercial company. We are not a religious order, but if you would allow me a personal word, that would be it. I think humans are unique, but we could all use a little help. But of course, you've got to do your part. That's what we've talked about mainly tonight. Do your part. and I think God will do his part. It's a two way street. And we do play a part. There's a story about the man who took a rock pile in two years, turned it into a fabulous garden. People came from everywhere to see it. One day a guy came by, saw the garden, thought it was fabulous, but he wanted to make sure the gardener didn't take all the credit. So to get his point across, he meets the gardener, shakes his hand and says, Mr. Gardener, remember you and the good Lord together have this beautiful garden here. And the gardener said, hey, I understand that. I know what you mean. He said, if it wasn't for the sunshine and the rain and the miracle of the seed and the soil and the seasons, there would be no garden for sure. But he said, you know, you should have seen this place a couple of years ago when God had it all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's true. We do play a part. I'm glad I was not an angel. I think humans have a lot more fun. But here's what else we need. Inspiration. Emotional vitality, without that, the ideas you know, won't progress very far. They may serve you to just get by, but I'm sure you haven't spent this kind of money and this kind of time to pick up ideas just to get by. 
but we want to be able to flourish. However, that is a human being's two major objectives. And you might make these notes. One is to survive. First, we must learn to survive. Second, then we learn to succeed, which is beyond survival. But most people settle in just in sort of the survival mode, enough to get by. They've got all these resources to tap and they don't tap them because, you know, they're, they're getting by. You know, their kids aren't starving. You know, they've got a roof over their head, and some clothes to wear, and food to eat. But to go way beyond that, to flourish, not just to survive, but to flourish. I'm sure that's what all of us are here these two days for, to find more ideas on how to do that. Now, the idea part is fairly basic and upfront, right? We're going to talk about time management ideas. We're going to talk about leadership ideas. We're going to talk about good health ideas. We're going to talk about all kinds of ideas. And they're fairly easy to put forward. Here's what's a little more tricky, inspiration. Who knows why one's inspired and one is not inspired? Here's what I call it. It's a good thing to remember for the rest of your life. It's called the mysteries of the mind. And you'll be confronted with that forever, the mysteries. Here's what we have to do with most mysteries. Leave them mysteries. And learn to be curious instead of dismayed. Say, why is it this way? Say, I don't know. You get your own planet, you could rearrange it some other way. But on this planet, we seem to be guests. So you figure out how this one works, whoever set it up, right? You follow how it's been set up. Then if you get a chance for a planet, then you can rearrange the whole deal and say, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So if you ever get that chance, you can do that. But hey, on this one, it was prearranged before we dropped in here. But on the spinning planet headed somewhere, right, what is the deal? And part of it is a mystery. One of the mysteries, where did we come from? Where are we going? Some of those are a bit unfathomable. We try our best to understand. One writer said what? We see through the dark glass. It's we think we've just about got it figured out, but it's, it's a little hazy, it's a little dark. We can't see it quite as clear. But all of our lifetime, we keep searching for ways to see it better, see it better. Someday, hopefully, it'll all be clear. But some things are mysteries. I do a seminar like this, someone walks out and says, I'm gonna change my life. Someone else walks out and says, oh, I've heard all this stuff before. Why two different reactions to the same seminar? Just make the note, it's a mystery. And I haven't tried to solve that. So I'm going to make everybody walk out and say, I'm going to change my life. See, no, you can't do that. It's going to be however it's going to be. And the key is to be curious and not dismayed. Let the mysteries be mysteries. Interesting story says, the day the Christian church was started, a magnificent sermon was preached. And if you read the account of the sermon that was preached the first day the Christian church was started, it was a magnificent sermon. And it was a magnificent occasion. It said there was a multitude that heard this sermon, meaning what? A lot of people heard it. But there was an incredible variety of reaction to the people that, of the people that heard the sermon. It said some that heard the sermon were perplexed. And I thought, wow, this looked like a pretty straightforward sermon to me. Why would anyone be perplexed? And here's the simple answer. They are the perplexed. I mean, if, and if you try to figure that out, you go crazy. And here's what I learned to do. Leave the perplexed, perplexed. You can't straighten this out. It said some that heard this great sermon laughed at the speaker and mocked, laughed and made fun of him. I'd say, well, hey, this guy looked pretty sincere to me. Why would anyone laugh and mock? And it's a simple answer. They are the laughers and the mockers. And there's nothing you can do about that. You can't straighten it out. And you can't turn it around. You just have to let be whatever is and let it be rather mysterious, but learn to be curious and not dismayed. Then it said some that heard this sermon didn't know what was going on. And they're easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? They don't, they don't know what's going on. Somebody says, well, they should know. Well, your shoulds and shouldn'ts ain't gonna affect it. It's like saying the sun should come up in the west. Say, no, you got to leave this stuff alone. Just let the mysteries be mysteries and let what happens what happens. Let that all be. So some were perplexed, some mocked and laughed, some didn't know what was going on. But here's the rest of the story. It said some that heard the sermon believed. And that's who the speaker was looking for. The believers mixed in this whole 
mysterious array of human reaction to the same presentation. And you've just got to let this whole mixture of reaction be a mixture of reaction. And you can't be dismayed by it. Otherwise, the only cure for it is to get your own planet. Otherwise, there is no cure. Because I used to try to straighten all this stuff out. In the beginning, I used to say, I'll make them successful if it kills me. I almost died. You can't do that. It said some believed. And that's who the speaker was looking for. The believers out of this massive audience of a multitude. Now, here's what was interesting. It said the number that believed was about 3,000. So it was a pretty good first day. So make the note. You, you can have a good day in spite of the mystery. In spite of the mystery of reaction, in spite of who's who, in spite of what happens, in spite of the full variety of human reaction and human behavior, in spite of the whole mix in each community, in each place, in each school, wherever, in spite of this whole mysterious mix of how things are and how humans react and how they behave, here's what you can have. A good day. 3,000, the first day. Wouldn't you call that a good day? 3,000. I've had some pretty good days, but not 3,000. Amazing. So, let the mysteries be mysteries. But inspiration, hopefully I've caught you at the right time where you'll be inspired to listen, inspired to take notes, and then inspired to give it a try. And this is all I ask after the seminar is finished. Just try some of this stuff. Some of the ideas I'm going to share with you the next two days. Just give it a try. You never know till you try, Papa said. See if it'll work for you. And then here's what's next. Refine it all as you go. First you learn, then you try, then you refine, then you evaluate, then you pass it on. But here's the key is to turn response into results. I appreciate applause, but applause is not the deal. For me, here's what's valuable, is to have this stuff work in someone's life. To have it make a difference in someone's income, have it make a difference in someone's financial future, have it make a difference in someone's health, measurable difference in someone's future and health. That's, that's my game. And if, it, if I can give you something that'll help make a measurable difference as time passes, see, that's, that's what's it for me. Key phrase, results is the name of the game. I do another seminar called The Five Major Pieces. It's also the title of a book, but here's those pieces. One is philosophy. We're affected by what we know. Next is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. Third is activity or disciplines or work. Labor, it's called. We're affected by what we do. And number four is results. Learn to measure and count to see how you're doing. Making progress is the name of the game. And here's how I describe it. Measurable progress in reasonable time. That's what we ask of our kids. That's what we ask of everybody. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. But results is the name of the game. We don't study philosophy just for philosophy or attitude just for attitude or discipline just for discipline. These things by themselves serve no purpose. But these three items invested in labor, in the work, produces results. Now we measure our results to see how our disciplines are working, how our attitude is working, and how our philosophy is working. And if the results aren't to your liking, there's only three places to check. Discipline, attitude, philosophy, personal philosophy. It's a pretty simple process. Some people check interest rates. Well, you know, that's not where the real problem probably is. Check what you know, you may need more knowledge. Check how you feel, you may need to adjust your attitude and check your disciplines and you may need to add a couple to the ones you're already engaged in. And that'll start immediately to changing the results that you can measure, that you can count. And you might add one more word here, way. Okay, way and count and measure. Because that's, the game is productivity, progress and productivity. Then something we're gonna talk about, which was number five, which is lifestyle. Because here's the ultimate expression of life, and that's to live a good life. Living well is the ultimate expression. Not philosophy, not attitude, but living well. Hopefully I'll give you some guidelines that have come my way, translating response to results. 
Now, just finishing up, make these notes. To get the most out of the two days, here's number one. Everybody would agree on number one. Be thankful for what you already have. Here's the next one. Be eager to learn. I know all of you already know a lot, but be eager to learn the rest. I've learned a lot in my years, but I'm eager to learn the rest. Now I'm trying to capsulize my learning. I'm trying to accelerate my learning, right? Because I don't have a couple hundred years left. So I've got to accelerate my learning curve, especially in the next four, five, six, eight, ten years. And I'm asking you to do the same. An accelerated learning curve to maximize the time to learn as much now in one year as you used to learn over five years. Just accelerate the curve, eager to learn. No matter how much you know, you can always learn a bit more. Improve your life, sometimes to a startling degree. 